Hello, everyone. Welcome to Badger Talks Live, new online version of our face-to-face -face Badger Talks program, which features over 350 current and former UW-Madison faculty and staff who give talks around the state of Wisconsin. I'm Tom Zinnan, and I work at the UW-Madison Biotechnology Center. I also work for the Division of Extension in the 4-H Youth Development Program and the Community uh, Youth Development Program. Uh, at the Biotech Center, one of the things we try to do in the outreach program is to welcome people to come to their campus to experience science as probing the unknown. In addition to welcoming people to campus, we're happy to come to your community through Badger Talks and through 4-H. Um, when we come to your community, we like to not only speak, but also listen, to share, and to, part and to invite you to participate in the life of the university because your insights and your ideas are what help fuel the drive at our public land grant research university. At the Biotech Center, my colleagues are Liz Jesse, Paul Purick, Nikita Menon, B. Among, and Ken McCopfer. And one of the things we do is welcome people to come experience science as exploring the unknown. We do field trips to campus. Uh, we do Wednesday night at the lab in conjunction with PBS Wisconsin and the Wisconsin Alumni Association. We help organize science expeditions, the campus wide science open house every April. It was canceled this year because of the COVID. And then uh, we work with our 4 H colleagues in all 72 counties across Wisconsin. One of our goals, and we'll see this today, one of our goals is to connect people to the people, places, and programs in science outreach here at UW Madison. The second goal is to help you and anyone else that you uh, live with and work with, is to help you develop or expand your own science savvy. And that means to be able to use science better in making personal choices, informing public policies, and in making decisions in the face of uncertainty. Well, how do we do this? One way we do this is to start with four of the most powerful words in English ever strung together. Tell me a story. So we tell stories that are parables or puzzles or paradoxes. So let me begin with telling you a story. A while ago, I was at a teacher preparation, uh, teacher development workshop at the, in Washington, DC. It was organized by the Smithsonian. And the person who was leading this said, you know, kitchen chemistry is a really good way to go to engage young people in experiential learning and how they can develop their science literacy. For example, this person said, you can take a Tupperware vessel or Rubbermaid, and what do you get if you take and fill it half full with heavy whipping cream? You put the lid back on it, whoa, and start shaking it up. Now it takes about five to six minutes to shake this from cream into butter, but that was where she was going. Said. She asked, is this a kinetic, interactive, concrete? Is it an experiment? And have you proven, after you've shaken this cream into butter, have you proven that shaking is essential in turning cream into butter. And I looked around the room and I saw everybody nodding their heads, yes. And that's when I knew I have a mission for life. And that is because, whoa, this is very interesting, but I would like you to please think about being the cream. How many different things besides the shaking has this cream been exposed to? Has it been exposed to plastic? any of the gunk in there, uh, the heat from my hand, light, air. One of the great things about being skeptical is that it encourages your creativity as a scientist. And so, wow, there's all these different things that could be going on in addition to the shaking. So scientists are people who tend to ask, how do you know? Not just what do you know, but how do you know that? How do you show that? And best yet, how do you test that? How do you know it's not somebody else? 
Well, one of the great things about most humans is that most of us are born with two hands, and basically we are built to compare. You know the zodiac sign for Libra, the scales of justice? We are built, most of us, to compare two or more things at one time. So let's use some if-then thinking. Instead of uh, just using one hand, what if we had two? Because if it is the shaking that's essential, and if we have two things that are identical, except for the fact that we shake one and not the other, is this a fair comparison? And if after six minutes when you shake this and this turns to cream and this one doesn't, can you use that very powerful if then speaking to say, wow, if it was the plastic or the heat from my hand or the light or the gunk, then all, then this one would change to butter just like this one. On the other hand, if it's just the shaking that's essential, this one would turn and this one would not. So here's an early example of being able to say, wow, can we present sophisticated ideas in an elegant way with simple materials? And what's cool about this is here's an activity that lots and lots of people have done, and yet it's only an activity, it's only an experience. Yes, it's hands-on and kinetic and interactive, but have you really tested if shaking is essential? You don't need a whole lot more equipment, you just need a little bit more savvy to take two things and fair and fair and use the if then thinking and speaking tool to be able to say, wow, I can do that. Now, let's do a little grand care galloping gourmet. This is the two that I did yesterday. This is the one that I shook. And there's the butter. You can even see that it's kind of yellow. And here's the one that I didn't shake. And it's just liquid cream. So this is great. You've got, which makes, you've got this idea that you can test ideas using something that most of us are born with, our two hands. Um, but this is kind of messy and it takes six, eight, ten minutes to do. What if we had something easier? About uh, 25 years ago, I ran into a book called Which, uh, um, Science Fun with Dairy Foods, and it's written by my colleague, Bob Horton of Ohio State. And one of the activities in Science Fun with Dairy Foods is to pose the question, which makes better bubbles, skin milk, or whole? So I'd like to think about that for a couple seconds because I'm gonna go to the refrigerator and pull out the skin milk and whole. Which makes, skin, which makes better bubbles, skin milk, or whole? How do you go about addressing that puzzle question? I don't think scientists might. Let's see what we're going to do. So here's a half gallon of cold skim milk. Here's a half gallon of cold whole milk. If we have two types of milk, oh, by the way, A lot of times when I ask people which makes better bubble skin milk or whole, they immediately start arguing, which is a good thing. They argue in the sense of a scientist or a lawyer makes an argument. They start with, oh, I know this and this and this, therefore it'll probably be that and that and that. Uh, some people want to take a vote. Um, and one of the big things about developing science savvy is whenever you hear this phrase used, which makes better X, A, or B, you want to get to the idea we better want to test that. So instead of voting on it or arguing about it, we start with three of the most powerful words ever uttered, I don't know, and then three more, let's find out. So if we have two types of milk, how many cups we're going to need? Two. And if we have two types of milk, how many straws we're gonna need? Two, because if you have only one straw and two types of milk, you might enter into the land of contamination and you don't wanna enter into the land of contamination. Now, if you wanna save the planet by using only one straw, what can you do to make it fair? 
Well, you can get out your knife and cut it into two. All like that. I'm gonna use long straws because it's easier. So the next big question, we're gonna design an experiment now, a fair comparison. How much milk goes into each of these? Well, how much sounds like it's a quantitative question, but it's actually a relative question. The only right answer is, not whether it's one half, one half, one third, one third, two thirds, two thirds. The key question, the key answer to how much milk goes into each cup is the same. So this is one of the key aspects about what it takes to make a good experiment and what makes a good experiment better. Can you make the comparison as fair as possible? So now I've got two cups. I don't know how much they're filled, but they're filled about the same. And the test their bubblicity. Here is a cup. Here's a cup. And I can tell them apart because I've been doing this a while. This is the whole milk and that's the skin. You might want to measure, excuse me, um, mark those when you go to do them. So one of the cool questions is, wow, do you blow one bubble, one set of milk first and then the other? Or do you blow them at the same time? Or do you do it both ways? This is as uh, Yogi Berra used to say, when you come to a fork in a road, take it. So there's nothing that says you can't try it both ways. I'm gonna blow them simultaneously at the same time concurrently. So cool sound, all this great stuff, and you start looking at the bubbles, and I usually time when we're doing this as a group. How long does it take for somebody to say, oh, wait a minute, what do you mean by better? And that's a great question. Because the puzzle question is ambiguous. And while it's great to ask which makes better bubbles, skin milk or whole, the sooner you can get to the idea of well, what do you mean by better, the savvier you are and the folks that you're working with. So instead of asking which makes better bubble skin milk or whole, you've got to step up to say, whoa, how many different ways can I compare these milks? So on the, over here, this is the whole milk and it's cloudier bubbles um, compared to the skim milk. Um, they seem to be popping a little bit faster, so the duration is a little less than the skim milk. Um, the mounding seem to be about the same under the conditions we're doing it, but you can already see that the whole milk and the skim milk are not the same. Even now the bubbles are almost all on the whole milk and they're still here. Now there's other things that you can test because this is what's cool about you getting to use your ingenuity and creativity. Um, how many other things can you think of to compare the whole milk and the skin milk? So one of them is standability. Can you stand your straw up? And how long will it stand? And that gets to be a measure of the overall bubbles. Another is pokeability. State Dance of Wisconsin is the polka. And here you can test whether the two bubbles are distinctly different. And remember, they might not be. Now, you got all these cool things going on with your two types of milk and their bubbles. How are you going to organize all these insights that you and the person that you're working with could be your child or your grandchild or your neighbor? How do you organize all these ideas, all the things that you observe? Well, I'm going to issue a bad joke alert. Uh, how many legs do most tables have? Most tables have four legs. What do you call a table that has no legs? Data table. And the cool thing about making a data table is we go back to the idea of our two hands. We are built to compare. We have two hands. 
What is the Roman numeral for two? It's I, I. Well, the cool thing about I, I is this is a table with no legs. It's a data table. And here's how you make a data table. You take that two and you say an S for skim, the one column, the middle column, and H for whole, on the far right column. And then you can put all the different things here. Uh, clarity of the bubbles, size of the bubbles, number, duration, pokeability, standability, whatever you and your ingenuity come up with. And you have a table. Pretty cool thing is, you get around to the idea of, whoa, one known difference between whole milk and skim milk is actually the only known difference in composition is the butterfat, butterfat comp, uh, component. Whole milk has about 3.25% um, milk fat and skim milk has less than 0.1%. So when we're asking butter bubble skim milk or whole, what we're actually testing is, does milk fat affect bubblicity in milk. And we have pretty good evidence that it is. We have no idea what the chemical or molecular basis is of it, but we have a pretty good idea that we have been able to take a fair comparison, shift the conversation from which makes better bubbles skim milk or whole to wow, how does milk fat affect bubblicity and come up with different ways that we can compare whole bubbles with skin milk bubbles. Now, if you do this long enough, one of the weird things is one of the two milks loses its bubblicity. And you might want to ask, wow, how many different things has this milk been exposed to from the time that I poured it in here and started blowing in it to now a few minutes later? And this is going to be very similar to the cream experiment. Has it been exposed to light and air? Has it been exposed to plastic, both the cup and uh, straw? Any gunk in there? Any gunk from my breath, the passage of time? Again, these are all things that are good to encourage people to note, and then how do you test these ideas? And if we're gonna go with the idea of one of the big changes is temperature, is there a way that we can test the effect of temperature on the bubblicity of milk? And you can if you have four cups, two with skim and two with whole. And one whole and one skim that you keep at one temperature and skim and whole that you keep at another temperature. And you can do that with a water bath. Now, I'm in a kitchen here, and one of the great things about kitchens is they have both hot water and cold water. So you can make a hot water bath and a cold water bath and put two of your cups in the hot water bath and two of your cups in the, warm, in the cold water bath and then test the effect of temperature. So just as to get you to become dairy scientists or food chemists, but it's the idea of can we encourage people of any age or any stage and we encourage people to use simple materials to develop sophisticated ideas in an elegant way and be able to test things um, for, to be able to come up with ideas and be able to test those ideas in a pretty cool way. So I've been going on for about 16 minutes. We have about another 14 to 15 minutes. I'd be happy to take any questions that you'd like. Um, one of the key things about the work that we get to do is to say, what is science? How is science different from other ways of knowing? And that implies that people have thought about the different ways of knowing and how do we come to make decisions? How do we believe what we believe or doubt what we doubt? How do we change our minds? For me, science is this idea of not asking so much, what do you know? It's about asking, how do you know that? How do you show that? How do you test that? And how do you know it's not somebody else? Uh, there's a nice little way to get across this idea of how important it is to test things. If I ask when kids come to the biotech center, I'll ask them how do you spell the word scientist? And 
they usually know. Scientists are spelled this way, S-E-I-N-T-I-S-T. -E -I -I Fair enough. But if I ask them, what do you get if you take that second I and make it into an E? You get sign test. And experimental scientists really like to trust their ideas. That's a big, big part of what we do is to have ideas, figure out ways that we can test them. And this is one of the things that distinguishes science from many other ways of knowing. It is the ability to test ideas experimentally in fair comparisons that we call experiments. So what makes a good experiment and what makes a good experiment better are very pressing questions for us to think about. One of the great things about doing stuff here in a kitchen is that we can do things that are with uh, working with food. The cool thing about using milk or cream is that these things are familiar, food is familiar, accessible, inexpensive, and safe. And so food is a great thing to use when you're trying to develop science savvy with yourself or with your friends and family. So think about other things that you can do to be able to elevate going from an activity to an experiment, from a recipe to a fair comparison from being able to do an explanation to being able to do an exploration through experimentation so that you can test ideas and come up with evidence that, wow, this idea is more robust than some of these other ideas because that's part of what we are trying to do in helping people grasp their and enhance their science savvy. Now, one of the questions is, would plant-based milks work? I don't know. Let's find out. I don't have any with me, but I'm. Uh, if I could go down to the store, I could buy almond milk or oat milk or soy milk, and we can try those because that's what you do. Then the question is, what do you mean by better again, which makes better bubble skim milk or whole, or you can go ahead and say, let's characterize the bubblicity of milk. Now, one of the cool things about milk is here you already have this cool little thing here. And I don't know about you, but I was always told never ever play with your food. I'm trying to break that rule for quite some time. We do work in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. The E for engineering actually comes from Another word, if you know French or German or Italian or Spanish, you know that the word engineering in those languages actually begins with an I and not with an E. Engineero, engineer. And that makes it much more clear that the root of engineering isn't engines, it's ingenuity. So we want to give kids a quick way to be able to develop their ingenuity. Here's an ingenuity puzzle. How many ways can you take the straw with your milk? And how many different ways can you invent to move drops of milk from a cup of milk to the tabletop? That's not how much milk, it's how many different ways. It's an invitation to ingenuity. And of course, the fastest way the kids get is the droppy thing. And then they might do this with a little squeezing. And they'll forget often that just lifting it up in and out of the milk is a way to drop. There's four or five or six different other ways that you can do this. But this is again an invitation to say to folks, can you, how can you help encourage, especially in young people, their ingenuity? Now with this one, I'd like to say next step, how do you, can you invent the eyedropper? Well, what's an eyedropper? An eyedropper is a device that has uh, only one opening, and it's got a squishy part, so when you squish it, it drives air out, and when you release the squishy part, you can suck milk or anything else in. So, how can you do that with this? Well, you gotta go from having two openings to one, 
What if you just do this and lift up and squeeze? Got that. What if you fold this over? Whoa. So that you now have an eyedropper. You can lift and go like that. Now the next puzzle question is, can you invent the two-loaded eyedropper? It'll look a lot like this. So with that little hint and guided inquiry, if you take a straw and bend it in half, and get your two types of milk, can you invent a way to suck up with one squeeze of one straw, two different types of milk at the same time? Let's see if we can do this. So there's the skim milk and the whole milk. Squeeze, bubbles come out of both. Lift them up, and there it is. And squeeze them again. So for the rest of your life, if you have a straw and your ingenuity, you can invent a two-legged eyedropper. It's a pretty good thing to be able to encourage people to increase their ingenuity and their confidence in that. Now, another thing that we can do is to ask people to invent a squirt gun. So to take a little bit of straw thing like this and a Q-tip like this, first of all, if I put this in here, can I invent a syringe? And here you can suck up milk with a action of the piston that is the Q-tip. Now, we don't have these around in the lab. Excuse me, I have them around in the lab, but you don't have them in your kitchen. But here is a blue tip that we use on these micropipettes. And if you take a straw, a Q-tip and a blue tip, can you invent a squirt gun? And this is okay, because this gives you a chance to start talking about measuring and moving small amounts of liquids around the lab. This little guy we use to introduce this guy. And this is a micropipette. This is a $200 micropipette. And this is the kind of thing you can't do at home. This is why this idea of being able to welcome people to campus is a big deal. We want to be able to give you things that you can do at home, but we also want to let you have experiences that are pretty hard to have if you don't have access to a pretty cool research lab. So this is a $200 micropipette, and it's an adjustable micropipette. And this one has a range from 200 to 1,000 microliters. It's this little twisty guy. And the cool thing about this is that this, the adjustable micropipette, was invented here in Wisconsin, here at UW-Madison, at the biochemistry department and in the Enzyme Institute. So what this allows you to do is to measure and move small amounts of liquids in the lab, in a clinic, in a dairy plant. These are an international icon of molecular biology, and they're also an example of Wisconsin ingenuity. And so when we have stories to tell, tell me a story. Sometimes these stories that have local Wisconsin roots are some of the best stories that we can offer. Because they give us historical basis, they give us future aspirations, and they're pretty cool to be able to work with. Along those lines, if you look at your skim milk and your whole milk, now we're going to do a little bit of talk story. One of the cool things about skim milk and whole milk is that if you look at whole milk, it actually says it's vitamin D milk. Wow. If you look at the skim milk, it's vitamin A and vitamin D. The story that's great for us to be able to share as University of Wisconsin-Madison folks is 
Dr. Madison has about as good a claim as anybody as being the discovery place of vitamins, vitamin A, 1913, Elmer McCollum and Marguerite Davis. And that part of the milk, vitamin A, is in the fat part of the milk. Why don't we have to add vitamin A to whole milk? Because it still has its fat. What's taken out of non-fat milk, skim milk? The fat. So what do we got to add back in? The vitamin A. And then vitamin D is a great story because uh, in about 1924, uh, Steenbach, Professor Steenbach figured out how to shine UV light on food stuff to activate vitamin D precursors. And so, although we don't claim that vitamin D was discovered at UW Madison, the way to make it through UV light was developed here. And these are the kinds of stories that we can share that have historic value, but right up to today, they've got impact. And here's one of the other things that I like sharing with the science savvy aspect, and that is the whole idea of spin on words. The spin on words is like the spin on a baseball. If you're a batter, one of the things you have to do is learn how to pick up the spin that the pitcher puts on the ball, and the pitcher pitches the ball. If you're a pitcher, you have to learn how to put different types of spin on the ball in order to confuse the batter. We also do this with words, um, and a great example is vitamin D. Um, if I asked you how many of you would like to put a steroidal protohormone into milk, not very many people would raise their hand. But if I asked you how many people would like to have a bone building vitamin put into their milk that helps supplement sunshine, most people would say yes. So those are two different spins on the same thing because vitamin D is a steroidal protohormone. Part of my job, part that I like a lot as the son of a history teacher, is being able to help train, help people pick up with their ears the different kinds of spin that people put on things uh, in terms like this. So, um, thank you for watching today. It's been a pleasure to get to talk with you about Science Savvy, how we want to welcome people to the Public Land Grant Research University. I want to say hi to my folks, to my friends at Mendota Elementary School and the scholars there who I get to work with. I hope they'll be watching this um, and archive. Um, one of the things when we have people come to campus, especially third or fourth graders, is I ask them, so who owns the university? And a lot of fourth graders think I own the university. And I have to say, well, yes, I do. I'm a co-owner. Uh, but there are 5.8 million co-owners of the University of Wisconsin system, including UW-Madison. And that is all the 5.8 million people who live in Wisconsin. And then I asked the third graders, are you guys taxpayers? I go, no, I'm not a taxpayer. I, my mom and dad sure are taxpayers, but I'm not. But I ask them, okay, but if you go to the store to buy a $1 Snickers bar, how much more do you have to leave at the store than just a buck? And they all know they have to leave more. Some of them know it's $1. six. So the amazing thing about this is that even third graders, anybody who buys handy clothes, computers, anything like that in Wisconsin, is a taxpayer through the sales tax. And that means they are a co-funder of their public land grant research and extension university and of the UW system in general. And that raises the question of what does it mean to be a good steward? This spring, we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. And Earth Day was launched um, by Senator Gaylord Nelson of Wisconsin in 1970, 50 years ago. And that stewardship of the land is a long-running theme in Wisconsin culture. And stewardship of any public resource is also a big deal. So that's one of the things that's 
great about being able to come to communities and share science with folks or being able to welcome them to the biotech center at the campus of UW Madison and help. Um, these are pretty interesting times and it's a very gratifying thing to be able to share ideas and talent and develop talents with folks as they're using science and helping them make personal choices and form public policies. So um, thank you all for tuning in and please join us for our next Badger Talks live. That'll be this coming Thursday. It's going to be on um, balance through ballroom dance. And uh, you can see the complete schedule of live talks at badgertalks.wist.edu. And you'll also be able to link to the YouTube there where uh, all the Badger Talks lives are archived in closed captions. So thank you very much. Hope everything goes well for you and your family.